has been six long months since the lives of residents who are downstream of the Akosombo and Pond dams were turned upside down. The impact of the spillage on the downstream residents has left many asking about what due diligence was done prior to opening the dam gates. More importantly, why haven't investigations been launched into the incident? Are we at risk of another flood, maybe even more devastating than we have seen? Today on Hot Issues, we go on a search for answers. I am Kemeni Amano, and as you may recall, thousands of people lost their homes and livelihood, especially at the center of the disaster in Mepe. Government only promised, but in reality, he has done little to resettle victims. Today, I sit with Member of Parliament for the area to discuss the recovery and resettlement efforts in Mepe and other affected communities. We will also delve into NDC's bid to reclaim power in the 2024 general elections. My guest today on Hot Issues is Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa. Honorable, thanks for sitting with us on Hot Issues. Always a pleasure. Good to see you. Likewise. Um, I wanted to start with Mepe, uh, the dump spillage, the epicenter of which was Mepe. Um, months after the floods and the disaster occurred, what do we understand were the failures that led to that? In terms of what has caused this and what brought us here, the jury is still out there. We do not know exactly what went amiss. We do know that the VRA has spilled from the Akosombo Ekpon dams uh, on multiple locations, from the Akosombo dam between 1968 and 2010, the last spillage before the 2023 one was in 2010. We never saw this level of devastation. Right. This catastrophe is really novel. Uh, we've never seen anything like this. Um, so in terms of what has caused it, I will wait for the parliamentary inquiry which is outstanding. You remember the speaker ruled that the House mm -hmm. taking a serious view of the matter because this really uh, is a national disaster. The House will constitute a bipartisan committee to inquire into these matters. So I, I would not want to prejudice the work of the, the committee. Let's wait and see what comes out in terms of what went amiss, uh, why uh, did, did, did we see this, you know, massive levels of, uh, of, 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 of flood waters and, and, and why did it cause so much devastation? Has it not been a while since this disaster occurred? What's the holdup in, in getting the information we'll need to prevent this from happening again? So you have a point there about the Lao, the long period of inactivity in terms of an investigation mm -hmm. into what caused this. Um, I expected investigations to happen on multiple fronts. I expected that the VRA itself will have carried out an internal inquiry into this matter mm -hmm. and publish that report. Elsewhere, that will have happened. Indeed. Secondly, I was suspecting that the executive so the commander-in-chief of the Ghana Armed Forces, the president. Because, you see, I would not believe that the VRA went ahead to open the floodgates without informing cabinet, which is chaired by the president, and what were the emergency preparedness measures put in place. And seeing that this went totally awry, absolutely catastrophic, what has the executive done? I expected at least a commission of inquiry on the part of the executive. Indeed. Again, that hasn't happened, which is very disappointing. It, it, it shows a certain leadership failure, leadership paralysis. And you see, citizens don't expect that. You always owe us a duty of care when you are in leadership. And when things go wrong, when people, no fault of theirs, just because of your action, Properties are lost, you have massive devastation, people's livelihoods are destroyed, houses are damaged. 
If you look at the NADMO statistics, about 40,000 people, 40,000 people displaced. In my constituency, which is the epicenter, NADMO tells us that 12,633 people displaced. And this is just those who have lost homes, the 1,500 houses which were damaged, according mm -hmm. to NADMO. We have not added those who lost farms, those who lost their fish cages, right. those who lost their livestock, those who lost their shops. Uh, government has been so lethargic, has been so, so slow. And you see, this is not what you expect. Look, I keep saying that there is a reason why under Article 177 of the 1992 Constitution, there is a contingency fund. It is for emergencies of this nature. And every year, we approve money into the contingency fund. I mean, even though at a point, Ken Oforiata, the former finance minister, virtually collapsed that fund and created a contingency vote where he himself, you know, just decided to do whatever he wanted. And that's how come on our blind side he was using the contingency vote to build a national cathedral when he had told everybody that he was not going to use public funds, including the president. You know, they misled the clergy, misled the Ghanaian people. It had to take some of us, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to really unravel what was going on. So the contingency vote provides for funds because in a year you can't predict what really will happen. There will be a disaster or two. Right. There may be some emergency situations. So mm -hmm. 533 million was voted for the contingency, you know, vote in 2023. Mm -hmm. How is it? that none of that money could come to our aid. This year, we have voted about a billion, you know, into the contingency fund. We said that, look, we must revert to the Article 177 provision. It has to be a contingency fund. So about a billion there. I mean, what are we waiting for? This is an emergency. But why do you think that there hasn't been any action to find out, to get to the root cause of what happened to, you know, Ghanaian citizens in that part of the country? It is mind-boggling that up to this point we haven't had the executive conduct an inquiry mm -hmm. and and you see the what we must be conscious of is that inquiries is not necessarily to if you like apportion blame or witch hunt but in other jurisdictions why they are big on inquiries is for lessons to be learned Mm -hmm. for far-reaching recommendations to be implemented, for institutions to be reformed, you know, so that they perfect the system. They get better. But, you see, if you turn a blind eye and you pretend that nothing happened, you know, and there's no inquiry, uh, you, you are not, you know, having an empirical, thorough review of what has occurred, you are bound to repeat the same mistakes. And this time we were lucky. Nobody died directly as a result of the disaster, even though people have died afterwards in the camps. You know, those who had underly see. underlying conditions. And, and we don't talk about it, you know. Uh, but, 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 but... People but, died. Yes, I've lost three people, you know. Um, they, 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 in the camps, they, 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 they were sick, one, one elderly... Uh, one, a young, you know, asthmatic uh, constituent of mine, and then um, uh, a little uh, kid who passed a, a few days ago. So, so, you see, we are still reeling under the consequences of this. We really need this inquiry. And, 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 and at this point, as an MP, the only arena where I have some leverage is Parliament, seeing that the VRA as an institution has not conducted this. There's no publication out there. Uh, and the last time I checked when there was a stakeholder meeting, it was clear they hadn't done any, any internal inquiry about this matter. The executive, as we all know, has not done that. We are now left with the legislature to carry out this parliamentary inquiry. And I do hope that in the next days, only this week, I, I, I raised it on the floor, the right honorable speaker who has been very supportive who ruled um, uh, much earlier that there will be a parliamentary inquiry. He has said that he's in the consultative phase, making sure that he wants this committee to be quite a novel committee, where it will not only be members of parliament, but he will bring in experts. Until then, we, we risk another MEPE. But yes, I, I want us to look at the people now. That's a reality. Uh, five months on, what are the living conditions of the people 
who were affected by the, the floods? It's, it's, it's very difficult, my dear. It's very, very difficult. Um, I wish I could tell you that all is well, we have recovered, there is restoration, and that you know people have put uh, body and soul together and normalcy has returned. But unfortunately, I cannot say that. Um, as I speak to you, we still have about 10 displaced camps. If you go to Mepa Degome, you see there's our biggest displaced camp now. You go to Agbetipo, there's a camp there. You go to Bato Die, there's a camp there. You go to Dofwa Didome, you go to Blonu, Alabonu, Fujoku, you see these camps. And people are living in really despicable conditions. They're living in destitution, abject destitution. They are living like refugees in their own country. hometown, their own country, the land of their birth. And we've had to rely on tents. All we are saying is that treat us with respect, respect our rights. Mm. And let me, let, me, let me conclude by saying that this week, I read a statement in parliament asking five institutions to move in quickly and replace the Ghana cards, then uh, voter ID cards, the electoral commission must move in, health insurance cards. That was my advocacy on the floor of the house. When we come back, I do want us to look at a few of the privately raised funds, a few, uh, you know, a few more questions on that. Then we'll move on to your party and then parliament. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching Hot Issues. My guest today is not Tongo MP, uh, Honorable Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa. Thank you for, very much for your patience. Uh, one of the things I've seen you try to do is to be accountable to the people and to the Ghanaians who are helping you. Mm -hmm. So how much in total have you received in terms of donations? How much have been expended? What's the breakdown? Yes, so we have been publishing every single donation we receive. Uh, and, and I have said that Donations will not be received privately mm -hmm. under the cover of darkness. So if you have observed, everybody who wants to make a donation, uh, you see my chiefs there. So we set up structures. We have what we call the Accountability Elders Council. So they are always with me to receive donations. And majority of the donations, more than 80%, have been received in camps. I want the victims to also see because it also helps the healing process for them to see that People are really thinking about them. They haven't been abandoned. They haven't been forgotten. Uh, so all of these donations have been received transparently and publicly. Mm -hmm. And the Accountability Elders Council, they are putting together the total amount. So they set up an account. Mm. I'm not a signatory to the account. So it's chaired by Professor Emmanuel Neche Apedo. Okay. And we have the, there are six traditional areas in North Town. They are represented. So representatives of the chiefs and, and then elders are represented on that council. And uh, they administer the funds. So, at, at a so, casual look, how much so, do you think has so, been expended so, on recovery? So well, far? well, at the last time they told me that the donations that came in were about 255 uh, from different individuals, organizations, groups, and all of wow. that. They, they tell me that very soon, in the next few days, they will be done with a comprehensive account. So we will know how much in terms of uh, cash and then in terms of the items, material items that came in. So that report will be published. This week, your party, the NDC, held this moment of truth only to tell us about a Japa deal and what it would do with regards to, you know, people, people who were involved in the deal when it comes to office. But, I mean, we, did, it, did we not already know that? Was that a necessary moment of truth? It was. It was. It was absolutely crucial, absolutely necessary, because many Ghanaians have been asking, yes, we see the scandals. We are appalled by them. We are outraged by them. But what are you going to do as an opposition, as the government in waiting? Can we get some guarantees that when you come, these scandals are not going to be swept under the carpet? And that was the essence of this press conference. And you heard our national communication officer, the very dynamic and eloquent, super intelligent Sami Jinfi, mm -hmm. state that on the authority of our flag bearer, he is announcing to the nation that when we come to power, all of those responsible, look, $12 million. <laughs> We've just been talking about the VRA-induced floods, the spillage from the Akosobo Ekbon dams. If I had $12 million, all of my problems would be solved. And I would even extend support to the other affected constituencies. 
everything will be solved. Look, the beautiful houses you see, the first one cost 1.2 million cities, cities. <laughs> Just about, what, $100,000. The second one, 2.5 million cities because it has enhanced features. We added kitchen, we added storerooms, we added TV rooms. We made it a disability-friendly building. 2.5 million cities. That's what, about what, about $200,000? Mm -hmm. So imagine what $12 million can do. A country that not too long ago could not come up with 4 million cities, just 4 million cities, not dollars, to save lives at Kolebu. 19 people died, dialysis patients, at the renal unit. So, I mean, we cannot accept this wanton dissipation. And you see, what is happening now under this Akufuado Baumia regime. It's like a free for all. There's no elder in the room. Everybody is on a looting spree. It's as though a looting brigade has descended upon this nation. And you've been hearing me in other sectors. That, look, I can't point to one sector where we don't have a scandal. And that is why this press conference was absolutely crucial to, to assure the Ghanaian people that first of all, we will not come to power and repeat these things. Number two, we are going to make sure mm -hmm. that people are held accountable. Because this, if, if this is not causing financial loss to the state, then I don't know what causing financial loss is. I see. So at, at the press conference, one of the things that was mentioned was the fact that Mahama is incorruptible and will protect the public purse. My question is, does the NDC have the record to make this claim to the Ghanaian people? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I was about to ask my dear sister if uh, uh, you took a trip for some 10 years and you haven't uh, been in Ghana. Because if you've been in Ghana, if now compare the two leaders, um, look at what we were calling scandals under, under the NDC. I mean, some of them even were just comic relief. They say, what, some guinea fowls have flown to yeah. Burkina Faso. It turned out that like, it was not true. I mean, then there was what, buzz branding of 1.3 million um, you know, uh, dollars, which was refunded anyway. And right. see how, see, see President Mohammed's attitude, his whole leadership approach when it comes to corruption. We know that under President Akufado, a nickname has emerged for him as a clearing agent. Oh, the, if, same, the same nickname me match for President no, Mahama. No, President Mahama, look at, what, look at what happened to his deputy minister for communications. Just by thinking, dreaming, somebody will say, be a bad talk. She paid the ultimate price, lost her job. National service directors, when it emerged that they had, and it, he did that stink operation, asked his BNI at the time to go look there because he got a tip off that something amiss at national service. He didn't have to even wait for the opposition to raise it, like it's happening now. And immediately, people were sanctioned, people were prosecuted. I don't want to remind the Honorable Abuga Pele of what he's had to go through. And uh, well, when have you heard under this regime that they have prosecuted their own? That, I mean, and, and you can't say, because look, there's no government that is made up of saints. So no matter how you pontificate in opposition and talk about the things you would not do and all of that. There are some people, you don't know the motives of everybody you are going to form a government with. So some people will disappoint you, will try to dip their hands where their hands should never go. You need firm leadership, incorruptible leadership, that will crack the whip, that will make sure people are punished. We haven't seen that here. All we hear on a daily basis it's one defense, and the defenses are sounding ridiculous and preposterous by the day. It cannot continue. And that is why mm -hmm. many people are saying, look, I mean, you were complaining about a public debt at 120 billion. You've taken it to 600 billion. And yet, we can't see the money. You've borrowed so much. Look at what. Well, I, I mean, just, it, just, just look at what COVID brought. So you, you have been, President Mahama was governing with one oil. Failed. You have three. So I mean, this has been the most blessed, the most resourced government in the history of our country. And yet, very little to show. Well, um, I... how, come, how come under President Akufuado we can't have another Terminal 3? How come? How is that possible with all of this money? We can't have another UGMC. We can't have another Ridge Hospital. We can't have another Shai Osudoku Hospital. 
We can't have e blocks. We are still doing. We are still. We are still. We are still. We are still doing double track. I mean, how is? I mean, you have e blocks, uncompleted, left to rot, and children are going to school in the morning. By evening, they tell them go back home. We don't even have space for you. I mean, look at the state of free SHA. Look at the state of education in our country. Mm -hmm. I mean, how? How? How is this happening? I, I do want to talk about, you know, the Public Accounts Committee hearings and, you know, the issues that are coming out of the... Now, these hearings happen, but at the end of the day, they're just, you know, recommendations that come out of it. How can we make, uh, you know, PAC stronger? Yeah, so, first of all, I take the view that we should be more preventive. So, shouldn't we be ashamed as a nation that year after year, you have this spectacle which tells us how billions have just gone down the drain. Why are we not able to stop this? Look, we have internal auditors. What is going on in our institutions? Where are the internal auditors? I would have thought that the internal auditors are supposed to put in place systems, mechanisms internally to prevent the hemorrhage. So that's where I start from. Mm -hmm. Before I then come to Parliament and PAC, increasingly, I think that the Public Account Committee, I was expecting that would take advantage of the new standing orders, strengthen them. But perhaps they face a restriction because you don't have constitutional provisions. And so you can't have you know, subservient laws that will uh, overreach. But having said that, can we have a public account committee that can be given the teeth to bite? You know, where, and I've heard the Honorable Averji in recent times instruct the police to pick people up. Mm -hmm. uh, when they are picked up, what happens? Um, we have been talking, there was a time one of the chief justices told us that they will set up a special court. Right. Just be, for PAC. That hasn't happened, you know. Um, can we create a strong nexus linkage with the Office of Special Prosecutor? Because it's clearly been proven over time that you can't expect at the attorney generals to prosecute their own, I mean, particularly under this regime. But can we have a certain seamless transition where recommendations quickly move to the Office of Special Prosecutor and they can be up and doing to prosecute people and then retrievals? You know, it shouldn't only be about even punishments per se, but retrievals and confiscations so that we can use some of those monies to yeah. build houses for we've, the displaced. We've seen some to take charges care, in, to, at, the, at the park recently. Yes, in recent times. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should thank God for small well, messes, but, 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 but I think that, I think that we, we really... We, we really should overhaul. While we're on the system. subject of corruption, you have uh, unearthed quite a number of um, allegations against the, you know, the current administration. I, I'd like to find out first um, why that was important to you to do, but also where did they ever get to? What did we get out of that? What was achieved? I'm glad you asked this question, and, uh, and I, I get these questions a lot, that, yeah, you've been exposing a lot of scandals, we look out to your exposés, but uh, are we really um, achieving anything as a country? I say yes. If you really um, bear to look at the, the, if, the, the facts, if you, if you, if you uh, consider the fact that, first of all, the number of these exposés that blew the alarm, and the government had to backtrack. Take the Oslo Chancery expose, for example. Um, I mean, we will have lost about $12 million as a country. Because of that expose, the government had to pull out. The, the, the owner of the property was so upset. They said, ah, but you've already committed, you signed the contract, and even took us to court. We only recently won against you know, the property owner that, look, uh, they say they are not interested. They say the person who signed it didn't have the authorization of the minister. So allow them to have their money, allow them to, you know, to have their respite. So imagine if I didn't you know, put out that expose. We will have lost out. Take, for example, the presidential travels. I mean, it had to take a very concerted effort, mm. a very consistent you know, fight. The president didn't want to stop. We have a functioning presidential jet. 
in mint condition. Nothing wrong with it. The president just said he wanted luxury. He wanted to shower in the skies, as the defense minister told us when I filed my agent question. I thought it was untenable, absolutely unacceptable. Uh, and, honest... we have, and we have saved. Hmm? Now he has stopped. We have been tracking him over the last year and a half. He's, he's stopped. Some people have argued that it may not necessarily be because of my exposés, but the economic crunch that hit us. Be that as it may, at least, he, has, has he, he, he has stopped. And I remember that during those exposés, he even tried to pull a fast one. He didn't meet me there. Pretended he was traveling, you know, commercial. I remember you know, that. Yes, you know, and yet, because of our vigilance, we were still able to track. And, 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 and after that, he saw that, look, no new scheme will work. And he stopped. Take National Cathedral. Mm -hmm. Imagine if I hadn't blown the cover on this National Cathedral project and it was going on. Imagine how much would have been lost. I mean, the cost kept escalating. It started at $100 million, went to $450 million. As we speak, when during the vote of censure hearings of Ken of Riata, mm -hmm. we asked him to provide details on how much they have illegally withdrawn from the consolidated fund. It emerged that a hopping, a colossal, a staggering, 339 million Ghana cities. Can you believe that? $58 million mm. at the time. Imagine what $58 million can do in this economy, can do for people in education, in health delivery. We can end babies being born, preterm babies without incubators, mothers delivering the, on bare the, floors. The, the, the so, so, so the look, group put so, together to put to to so to, so, 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 so they have been to successes. construct or deliver the um, the national, the national cathedral. cathedral. Uh, they came up with a breakdown of that uh, figure. Mm -hmm. Did you see it? Yes. Did it make sense to you? Yes, I, I have a copy here. It it it, it, it cannot make sense. I mean, uh, it it certainly cannot make sense. I mean, site preparation alone, uh, five point one uh, million Ghana cities. Site preparation, you know. Only God knows what kind of site preparation that is. Consultancy alone, consultancy, 61.7 million. Well, the, the explanation is a consortium. So it's not just one company. Led, led by Kari Summers. Kari Summers, who presented himself as the CEO of the Nehemiah Group. When I followed up on this address and went to see the Nehemiah Group, I ended up, I thought the GPS in America is no longer working. In Missouri, I ended up in a coffee warehouse where they sell coffee, some ranch-shackled warehouse. Six million dollars. Well, I, I can understand that. Then but, there's, but you know it's then, also legal then, for people to just have, they pay for office addresses, but it doesn't mean they <laughs> exist over there. <laughs> I mean, Imposters, all kinds of imposters. No value for money. No, look, any wonder that we now have the world's most expensive pit in Accra. Is that something we should be proud of? Look, just the if you go through the 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 shocking breakdown, mm, the shocking breakdown, you see here that fundraising. Mm, U.S. fundraising, they, they, they raised 794,000 Ghana cities. Ended up spending all of that at, at Kempinski, what they call, uh, they did a Bible symposium. Mm. Mm. You go through this document. And, and then some uh, equipment uh, uh, were uh, also uh, bought for the contractors. Uh, JNS Talent Center Limited, 2.6 million. When, and they say it was for contractors mobilization. This is what led me to uncover the double identity, you know, yeah. character. Uh, Reverend Kusi Boatin, Kwabna Edu Jemfi, now they claim that it was a loan that he was given to them and they were paying him back. It's a certain weird, I mean, you I, know, story. I, I, at this point, Meanwhile, we were told they, it's contractors' mobilization. Uh, can the Ghanaian uh, people you, say you that have here, there you, won't be any national cathedral at the end of this year? Look, this project has... has has, has, has collapsed uh, because it was not, this was not well intentioned. I mean, this 339 million, David Ajay alone was given 130 million. If you look at Ken Ofreata's own breakdown, he presented to parliament. Mm. You know, so the money was not going into the project, it was going into other things. I see. And uh, we have a situation now where everybody has backed off. 
Um, all our international donors have seen that look, this whole thing. I mean, you remember when I went to the U.S., even the address that has been provided as our uh, American address. I went there. The, well. the property manager said that, look, there's no National Cathedral Secretariat here. So, so, look, we are dealing with the most reckless project. Don't forget that so many demolitions took place. The Malian ambassador's residence demolished. We have to pay for that. True. Scholarship Secretariat demolished. We have to replace that. The, the judge's, residence. judge's residence demolished. We have to spend thousands of dollars to house them. We are now constructing new houses for them. Then don't forget that Comsys IT firm demolished. We have to uh, replace their headquarters for them. Waterstone Reality, apartment complex, demolished. We have to replace. Then the um, deputy NCC commissioner, uh, uh, no, the Shraj commissioner, deputy Shraj commissioner, his bungalow demolished. It has to be replaced. The Judicial Training Institute mm -hmm. demolished has to be replaced. So when you add the cost of all of these replacements, that's why I have I've said conservative Probably estimates. We're talking about a billion dollars. I mean, I I mean it's, 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 it's I mean, just... So, what can Ghanaians look forward to in the future? What would a future NDC administration do about this national cathedral? I think that first of all, first of all, there has to be a national inquiry, a commission of inquiry into this whole... I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions of Ghana cities. You know, and thanks to the resignations of these respected clergymen, they are telling us in their resignation letter that, look, they didn't even have a hand in the choice of architect, even in the choice of the location, the land. You've read Bishop Duck's mm -hmm. resignation letter. You heard uh, what, uh, you read what Archbishop Duncan Williams and uh, Reverend Sud Andaba right. said, that they were calling for an audit. They wouldn't get that audit. So there's no transparency, no accountability. And, and so you see, and, and you see. So we, first of all, we must have an inquiry and see what we can retrieve. Carrie Summers must be returning our $6 million. David Ajay must be returning our 130 million cities. Look, we cannot continue to have our taxes. Well, he's already consulted in, and giving you in, a design. In, 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 in wrong hands. I mean, look, we know the market rates. You can't come and rip us off. Look, look we all saw what was well, going he, on. He had a service to give. Mm -hmm. And the government decided that we'll pay other rates. There are, there are rates, even where, where he operates in the UK. We all know the rates. We know how he bills. That cannot continue. So, so that's the first thing we have to do as, as a government when we come to power. And then we can have a national consensus on, on what we do with that piece of land. Some are saying, uh, let's have a specialized children's hospital. You know, that, that will be more pleasing to the Lord. Has the OSP taken interest in any of these exposés that you have done? Oh, yes. Yes, 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 they have. They have. And we are, we are, we are cooperating on a number of... I see. Which on, ones on, have on they taken interest issues. in? A number of issues. Uh, the, the, the Bank of Ghana one, um, okay. the exposés I put out about how the project started at $81 million. Mm -hmm. That was the approval that uh, they, they, they got from the PPA. And that's, they themselves, that's the approval they sought and received from the PPA. Uh, in a few weeks, it became $120 million. And then it escalated to $227 okay. million. Never, doesn't happen anywhere. And under uh, procurement laws, the whole tender should have been redone, should have been cancelled and redone. So I'm glad he's taking a look at that. I'm also glad that he's looking into the, uh, the, the airport land loot. Uh, you remember the heaven scandal which I exposed, and yes. um, um, they are they are looking into that, into as, that well. as well. Yeah, I see. and um, recently I've been talking about the uh, performance audit that the Auditor General has done. Okay. Very very damning, uh, and look at all the walls that Dr. Puni is being put through. Mm -hmm. um, the Auditor General has audited Crip One and Crip Two. Crip One is the Cocoa Road Improvement Project, which was done in 2015 under President Mahama, and. Uh, what was done under uh, uh, President Akufado. And the people who told us that they are going to end sole sourcing, I'm sure they meant single sourcing, and um, uh, single sourcing is all about corruption and all of that. This report is revealing that 87% of the road contracts that they awarded were single source, were non-competitive. 87%, not me saying, the Auditor General of Ghana, what is even more shocking, they budgeted $1.31 as what they will spend. End up spending $13 billion. $13 billion. Dr. Baumia was all over the place, overpriced single-source contracts. 
It's typical of the Jomahama era. It will not be allowed to continue. And this is over and, what and, period? And, and here we are. What makes this even so fascinating is that the Baumiers are involved. They are company, Resources Access Limited. On July 2nd, 2020, they were called to come for two contracts, valued at 83 million, single source to them. So after berating President Mahama, vilifying him, I remember all the insults, naked insults, you know, vicious attacks. See what they are doing. I mean, how can we build a country this way? You budgeted 1.31 billion. And then it jumps to one. And then you spent 13 billion. 87. Could, and, 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 and you see, what is even worse? No, it was budgeted in cities, everything in cities. What is even worse hmm, is that the auditors decided to carry out a simple exercise. The 13% done competitively. Let's assess the contract with those that were done non competitively. And they discovered that the single source contracts were three times the value. Three times. Hmm. Same project. If you read page 22 of this report, same project, same project, same qualities. The auditors found out that roles procured under the national competitive tender were one and a half to three times cheaper than what Cocobot got from roles procured using single source or restricted tendering. Right. Page 23 of this report. What, what are we able to do about something like this? Clearly, people will have to be made to answer. I mean, so first of all, this is going to go to PAC. PAC is working on the 2022 report. Right. This is 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, Parliament will take a serious view of this. Uh, and their recommendations will be made. But clearly, when we return to power, people will have to answer. This is clear, causing financial loss people, to the state. Is the NDC in the position to win the 2024 elections? Absolutely. Right we, we, we have no doubt. We have no doubt in our minds at all that we are winning. And it's not because we are complacent or, or, we, or we think that it is of right. Not mm -hmm. at all. Um, we have never seen such a shambolic government, such a corrupt regime, so wasteful, so clueless, so visionless. No, but so what are you cruel. offering to the Ghanaian people and, that will make them bring you back? Our, our, our flag bearer has been out there. I mean, look, he has offered so much that I'm beginning to read articles. The last one from Manasseh Azuri saying that, look, slow down. The economy you are going to inherit, you know, it's not, it's not going to be good. So slow down with your promises and rather assure us that you will just prosecute corrupt officials and retrieve the loot. But President Mahama has been big on the 24-hour economy because, look, apart from corruption, which is our biggest, biggest national crisis at this point, the next one, the next issue is youth unemployment. The 2021 population housing census is reporting that we have a closer 14% unemployment rate. They have, I know young people, constituents of mine, who have been sitting at home for three years, mm -hmm. for four years. It robs them of their dignity. That is why the 24-hour economy, which inherent in that is a three-working shift, which allows for companies that will subscribe under mm -hmm. the program to have incentives, you know, tax rebates and, you know, special tax dispensations, you know, to employ more people. And the public sector is also going to, so, going someone to take the lead. Would argue, that is going to address... Someone would is argue, going, is going to address on the 24-hour economy, yeah. someone would argue that um, it's ill-defined and it's difficult to convince us that, that that is the wholesome solution to the problems of our country right now. What's ill-defined about it? I mean, the 24-hour economy is the 24-hour economy. We want to move. Well, we are we, not learning more about how to operationally. What we've got we from to, the NDC we, you, is, you, you, you clearly is, have not been listening to is, us and you've not been, you want me to send you there. We have a whole I, blueprint. I have seen the packet. Yes, yes. But, but, but it's, only, it's only a simplified version of what will actually be applied. Um, we are mm -hmm. yet to understand how this will be operationalized so that the Ghanaian people can reap from it. The NDC is taking too long in giving us that, but it's been propagating 24-hour economy. Mm -hmm. A buzz which some will say is, is, you know, trailing off. Oh, yeah, certainly. It's caught on. And uh, the TUC has described this as a game changer. That that's what this country has been waiting for. It's an idea whose time has come. Look, 
we have put out the blueprint. Uh, we have said that uh, the, the flag bearer is just teasing out portions of our manifesto. Uh, very soon, in a few months, we are going to launch the manifesto. And that's where, if you want the full, full program to go into the details, the bolts and nuts, you, you're going to have it. But there's nothing mysterious. It's not rocket science. We are not saying we are going to space. I mean, we're just talking about a 24 economy which has worked in other jurisdictions and can work here. Is that, it's is that a, all? It's it's just, a, it's so it's a, just it's a 24-hour economy a, for the NDC going a, into the 2024 It's a very simple concept. I earlier talked about how we are going to deal with corruption. The, president, the flag bearer has said that he will have a no-nonsense approach. He has said that he will start from home. Charity begins at home, you know, and that even his own appointees will not be spared. He's talked about constitutional reforms. And under constitutional reforms, he's talked about a whole swath of governance, you know, um, uh, 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 governance reforms, which include, you know, cancelling the S. Gratia, for example, uh, reducing the number of ministers. He has said that he can work with no more than 60 ministers, mm -hmm. where we are now, 87 and the likes, you know, and it's going to be more because we thought that there's been a reshuffle. We thought they would take advantage of this reshuffle to reduce the number of ministers, but that's not what has happened. People are being removed from sector ministers. They are being sent to the presidency. They are still going to be drawing from public funds. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at the Lands Ministry, I'm told the deputy minister who was removed has just been appointed a special advisor to the uh, minister. So virtually nobody is going home. Uh, everybody is being asked to hang on to continue to draw you know, scarce uh, 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 taxpayer funds. So we are saying that we are not going to have this Obese, so, I mean, obese, but, so obese on, government. On the bread and butter issues is the 24 hour economy. The 24 hour economy. Well. Uh, the 24 hour economy, we are talking about. Uh, uh, we are talking about infrastructure. He's, he's, he said that, look, we must continue with our program to have uh, every regional capital having an airport. What? Um, he's, 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 he's talked about the need to have in agriculture, to have uh, farm banks, so I, to I mean, have I keep, I keep asking cooperatives. The so it's, I, we, we, we have not put out our comprehensive manifesto. I, I totally understand yeah. that. But I keep asking the NDC. Yes. You're, you're, you have very nice plans for the Ghanaian people. Yes. But before your 24-hour economy kicks off for you to get the kind of money you need to yeah. run the economy, you need to find the capital for Absolutely. all your, um, you know, your big projects, yes. right? Yes. I mean, you, you say you are inheriting a, you know, an economy that is bankrupt. So are you not just swindling us to give you the power because then there won't be money to do the things that you are talking about? Not at all, not at all. Look, in the midst of uh, our economic crisis, uh, this government could spend, not too long ago, I have here the Black Stars expenditure. Mm -hmm. They were able to budget $8.5 million. They spent $3 million for three matches. It's so an average of $1 million per match. This same economy. We are saying we'll put it into the productive sector. Qualifiers. Ghana versus Angola, 7.4 million. So it's not like there's no money in this country. Mm? Ghana versus Madagascar, 8.3 million. Ghana versus Central African Republic, cost us 3.4 million. Mm? Airlifting black stars from Qatar, just 2022, a few months ago. 5.3 million. Are we going to starve, you know... I, I, Funds released for payment of coaches' salary for just April to June. 3.37 million. Well, Ghana are we cities. then saying we are going to starve our national teams from engaging in some of these We would not, we would not engage in... Other countries are spending... If the same tournament, countries who did far better than us, Namibia, they did better than us. They went with a $1.1 $1 .1 million budget. Zambia went with a $2.1 $1 million budget. Nigeria went to the finals, not with the kind of monies that we... Their government, in terms of taxpayer contribution, was just $1.3 million. So this cannot continue. And yet, with all of these hundreds of millions of Ghana cities, we don't even have one FIFA standard pitch in this country. Not one. We don't even have a sports policy. So we are saying that, look, we can cut down the wastage. We are not going to spend 339 million Ghana cities to dig a hole. $58 million mm -hmm. to dig a hole in the name of the president's cathedral. We are not going to be budgeting $1.3 no, billion I, I, I and we spend $13 billion, uh, with no value for money. Road projects with are three times, is it not the three same, times is it, the value. It, so, and again, so, I don't mean so, to equalize, so, but is it not the same party that spent $3 million in uh, bonuses for the Black Stars also? 
in Brazil, you remember the World Cup? Mm -hmm. We flew that amount and mm -hmm. it became, a, you know, qu quite a scandal for the Mahama administration. And so the Westage is not, a, it's not a, 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 an Akufuado administration problem alone. We've seen it also under the... Uh, in, in Brazil, yes. here, this $3 million, it doesn't include bonus because we didn't win a single match. Let's not compare oranges and mangoes. They, we didn't win a single match. So imagine if we were winning matches and we had to pay bonuses. Clearly, the $8.5 million would not even have been enough. In Brazil, we were winning matches, and players had held the sports minister to ransom, said they won't play the next match, and so money had to be sent. They said they won't accept any wires into account. They want to see cash. What did President Mahama do after that? He set up a commission of inquiry. The sports minister at the time right. was, was, was removed. Here, we have the sports minister who is at post and being asked to go and oversee the Africa games. So, so and the in the point, next few I mean, the days, in the next few days, I'll be publishing the next scandal already starting from the, from the, from the Give Africa us an games. Idea what's the, I mean, what, what is in there? You will be shocked to see some of the figures, what they intend to do and what they have done already. Just stand by for that. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. So we are saying, we are saying that, we are saying that, we are saying that incorruptible, it's a, it's a incorruptible, than... incorruptible leadership. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I don't think that this country really, because if you look around us, I mean, Ivory Coast, Benin, they have got, they, 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 they are, their bonds are being oversubscribed. They have not been shut out of the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the international financial market. I mean, they are not doing financial haircuts. They are not seeking bailouts. So, so, I mean, so, so, what I was so, driving so, at so with the, the right leadership, that. with the right leadership, uh -huh. you can save money to invest in the productive sectors of your economy. And that's what we are going to do. I see. So, I mean, what I want, I want you to address is, is because the issue transcends government, I mean, one may be bigger than the other, mm -hmm. we need to find a you know, solution to the problem. Have you identified what a problem could be with the sports ministry and the Black Stars, and how can we deal with it? Clearly, what I see is that uh, you're giving a blank check I mean, they come up with a budget that's treated as nuclear code. As a member of parliament, I cannot be told what the funds are, what has been budgeted for, and they even have the F on the audacity mm -hmm. to engage in such illegal conduct, to put together a budget and go and spend. They tell us that when they return, that's when they will count. When ab initio, at the first instance, you need approval from parliament. That's what our constitution says. You cannot just come up with a budget, dip your hands in public funds without parliament's approval. I mean, it's unconstitutional. And that's what is going on. So we, 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 look, we need to put in place a new regime of transparency and accountability, mm -hmm. respect for our constitution, respect for our Public Financial Management Act, and have sports ministers who will respect the laws and who will not allow the GFA to hold them to ransom. And as we said in Parliament, look, the far-reaching reforms we must carry out, even if it will attract a ban, let FIFA ban us. There are some countries who were banned that they are doing far better now. Look, we Very cannot, well. we cannot mm, treat the GFA like a fetish and you can't Touch it, you can't talk about them. And that's why I salute sports journalists who led a demonstration recently, a very successful one, very impactful one. We have received their petition, and Parliament is going to launch an inquiry into all of these, you know, just dissipation of resources, and we are not seeing value for money. I see. That, that cannot continue. So, look, it all comes back to just leadership. Do we have a leader who genuinely loves the country? A leader who wants to leave a legacy? A leader who will pursue the national interest, who will be patriotic, who will not just, you know, embark on just fantasy ideas. You don't well, have, so you, I, don't, you don't have let's, hospitals, let's you don't have good roads, and you say you want to build a manger for, has, has Jesus Christ told you that he's going to be reborn? Uh, when where do, is the NDC campaign? Where, where in, in Christian doctrine, uh, where? Anybody should show me a scripture in Christian doctrine, where Jesus Christ is supposed to be reborn uh, will come and stay in a uh, manger in Africa. Where? Where, where is what, the, what, what do these people take us for? Where is the NDC campaign team? Why is this taking so long for the 
NDC to announce its own campaign team. Are you preparing for the election seriously at all? You don't see us campaigning. You don't see the flag bearer all over the country. The flag bearer is, we work but with, he's going to need a we, team. We work, Where is his team? We, we, we work. He, he, did you see him alone? As President Mama told you that he's so lonely. <laughs> when he goes around the country, is he alone? Your, your competitor has launched his campaign team ready for battle. Where is yours? Very revealing campaign team. Now we know the people at the National Cathedral, what exactly was going on there. Look, um, we are not going to be uh, following uh, other people's strategies. We have our own strategy. We will do what we must do mm -hmm. according to our strategy. If you have observed, the flag bearer made it a conscious effort to travel the length and breadth of this country, to listen to the people. Right. He is on a listening tour, which is also feeding into an organic manifesto. That will not be utopian. That will not be a pie in the sky. That will be the felt needs. It will be responding to the felt needs of our people. So we have our own strategy. At this point, it is about being close to the people, listening to them, empathizing with them, letting them know that, look, we have a party that is a listening one, a leader who cares about us, who mm. is in the trenches with us. It's not all about just being at the top and you know, creating campaign teams and all kinds of structures that are not on the ground. And, all, and, all the and, same, and, I'd ask and, you. And, 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 and having said that, having uh -huh. said that, I am also not aware I'm also not aware that the NDC does not have party executives from the national, regional, constituency, all the way to the branch level. And what is the, what, what is the job of party executives? Your, your permanent job is to campaign for the party. I'm not sure if that is a fair response to the question because those it's executives have always existed. It's very fair. But you've had a campaign team yes, on, on which, the side. Which is launched at the right time. Which is launched at the right time. And, is, and, and, it's taking a little too, it too, is not. too long this it time, is, isn't it? It is not. Not, not at I all. See. I see. Check, check, well. check four so, years ago. It's not. This is not at all. Fair, I mean, that, that fair just, enough. Fair that enough. just caps in uh, fair when, fair when, enough. when really so, the campaign so, so, is launched. So, I mean, you, we, we you, you were campaign we haven't, communication we haven't launched 2008 the, 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 the campaign. Yes. What kind of um, people do you expect to be in your campaign team? We've seen those who went for 2008, 2012, 2016 that failed, 2020 that failed, 2024. What will be the winning campaign team for you? I don't really, I'm not big on campaign teams. I don't think that that's what really matters to the Ghanaian people. I'm rather big on manifesto. Um, the vision for our country. We are in a quagmire. Who cares about campaign Well, teams? I mean, not, not for the Ghanaian people. Yeah, not, we're, we're, but, we're, we should be thinking about... But for be, the we strategy be, to win should, the election. We should, we should be thinking about... We should be thinking about how we are going to pull Ghanaians out of the doldrums. That's what... Look... What, until, what, the, until you what, win the elections, what, what you engages, cannot do that. What engages us... Look, they, we, we don't spare a thought over... The, the NDC is replete with experts on campaigns. I mean, we're the most successful political party in this country. Very most well. successful. I mean, it's not, you're not talking to a party that uh, probably uh, struggles to win elections. So We've also we, seen we your not, flag bearer um, we are not, we are not, shift we don't dates when about. it comes to who would be um, his running mate. I challenge you on that. When, well, when, first when, he when, said February, when, no, and then yes, now yes. I've heard March. The, the flag bearer, what matters really? You need to distinguish between the choice and when the choice is announced. I am clear in my mind that knowing President Mahama, the experience he has, the track record he has, I'm clear. And I see all the signs. He knows who he wants. He, he has his choice. He made his mind long ago. Okay, what, so, what signs so, do you so, see? So it is just about when that choice will be announced. Fantastic. What yeah. signs do you see? <laughs> what are the signs that you see that, you know, gives you the impression that the choice has already been made? Lead me not into temptation. Uh, one thing that has trailed the NDC, in fact, uh, you know, the, the Muhammad administration was admired for 
bringing young people aboard. It's um, it's it's time in office. But mm. at the same time, there were a lot of criticism, criticism that had begun um, from the Mills' era up until you know the Mahama administration. You recall the term babies with sharp teeth. Are the babies with sharp teeth returning with Mahama? Should mm -hmm. he get the nod? Again, I mean, I would be very uh, presumptuous and, Should and, they? and 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 totally um, really out of order to uh, begin to pick uh, the incoming president's nominees. I'm sure that the, the 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 president will make his choices. But look, let's see how beautiful the NDC has proven. And and to be fair to the NDC's traditions, it's not new. It starts with President Mahama, right from the PNDC era. Look at the likes of Uncle Totobi Kwachi, Uncle Kwame Nahoy, Uncle Atua Hoi. These are young, sharp folks, this is dedicated all their energies. You know, the likes of you know, Kwame Pepra and all of that. These are very young people, you know, who serve this country very well. I mean, Kwesi Boche, when he first came in, you know. Um, so, we, we've had a rich tradition of uh, young people giving the opportunity. You see, what I like about the NDC is that we don't, we don't say that, no, it should be just, you know, a gathering of um, uh, old fossils. Right. Um, um, but it's always a blend so that you have the experienced hands, but you also have young people who have the energy, the dynamism, the freshness, mm -hmm. you know, modern perspectives, and all of that is brought to bear. So I would not be surprised to, to see this long-standing tradition continue where you have, and, 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 and see, even in parliament today, who are those holding the fort? Imagine Professor Mills didn't take a risk, didn't take a bet on me, mm -hmm. you know, on, 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 on the likes of... Uh, you know, the Honorable to force him, the, right. the Honorable John Jinapo, you know, uh, out of parliament. You know, Dr. Mane Buama, who is election director today. I mean, Felix Ufosu Kwache, you know, the Honorable Joyce Bawa, and, and, and all the yeah. others who are, who are, who are, who are, who are, who are doing so well. And these names you have mentioned were those so, who were referred to as the babies who were sharp teeth well, by I don't, the I, founder of the party. The founder didn't mention specific names. Again, this is propaganda. Uh, people decided to just, you know, select whoever they probably want to fit in that uh, description. But to be fair to the founder, he didn't mention any specific name. He didn't mention However, any name. And, and you know, look, I mean, we all know that uh, founder was very colorful. He had a way with, with words and, you know, all kinds of terminologies and jargons. At the end of the day, I think that what really matters well, is that... The, the point is that he was making then, what, 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 on, what, the point he was what making really then matters, was What really that, matters is that um, those people, those people, with sharp those people teeth, who, which included okay, you... Okay, let me allow you. Uh, absolutely, yeah. thank you. These babies with sharp teeth, which included you... How do you know it included me? What, did, 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 you, wide, did you interview widely, President Rawlings after his speech? Widely, widely, because, because mm -hmm. you were one of those who spoke, you know, a lot for the government, and, and his point was that... Um, you, you went after anybody who criticized the administration of the time. Um, do you have any regrets with that? So my job, don't forget, as Deputy Minister for Information, was to fiercely and convincingly defend the track record of the Mills Mahama administration. That was my job. <laughs> Those were my marching orders and that's why I was engaged mm. to be a spokesperson. When you're a spokesperson and you are convinced about how well Professor Mills is, how a blessing he is to our country, he, and God bless his soul, such a great man, he, a mentor I would, I would always be proud of. He was not guilty of the accusations that were being leveled against him. And I had to defend his track record, mm. as all ministers of information, deputy ministers of information do. So I have no regrets at all. I mean, for defending such a good man, I wish I even did more. I wish I was even more out there, particularly if I, I even had the slightest idea that he would not be with us for that long. He would be such a great man. I mean, that's why I named my son after him. You know, I, I, I'm always in awe. Uh, so squeaky clean. Look, I suffered a lot of baseless attacks. I mean, you remember them saying I own filling stations all over. Indeed. I don't own one. I'm not a businessman. 
<laughs> I mean, naked, wicked lies. I mean, then claims that I was flying abroad every weekend. Recently, I hear they tried to smear me with that again. Me, flying abroad every weekend. And you say, Professor Mills, the modest, selfless Professor Mills. I mean, and they don't provide any proof, any evidence, and they just say it. And, and sadly, you meet even discerning people, and they were all caught up in it. They believed it. But I am glad that we'll find time, more time, to talk. time has vindicated me. I mean, I didn't come into public. Of, look, you can't have Professor Mills as your role model we'll, and, and, we'll and, and come into public office to engage in these, you know, very crazy honorable, and wild honorable, we'll find, allegations we'll find that people make. We'll find more time to talk. Thank you so much for your time uh, today on the program. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. My guest today has been Norton Web P. Honorable Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa, we've been discussing issues of his constituency, of his party, and of general governance in this country. I hope you enjoyed this episode. There's always a playback on Facebook and on YouTube. I'm Kemeni Amano. Have a good evening. <laughs>